You know, it's not very difficult to be generous to your family and friends. You know them, you love them. What's really tough in this world is to be generous to total strangers. Being generous to strangers is the biggest test of our humanity. This is where it all begins, so say goodbye to all your fears, all your doubts. This is where they die. This is where we come to win, we come to fly. This is where we make our dreams come to life. Welcome to Innovation City. Welcome to Innovation City, a podcast featuring the innovators, disruptors, and creators who are making things happen. Uh, my name is Michael Johnson. I'm here with my co-host, Tyler Kelly. And today we have Dr. Julio Frank. He is the president of University of Miami. We're also here today in Miami today doing the podcast in Miami with University of Miami. Also, a uh, big thanks to Venture Cafe Miami as well for, for making this podcast happen. And the Emerge Americas Conference. This is an amazing event. We're happy to be here. Super grateful. And today, like Michael said, we're here with Dr. Julio Frank, who is a fourth generation physician who came over here from Germany. Your parents, your paternal grandparents came over here in the 1930s uh, to build a new life in Mexico. You're the sixth president of the University of Miami. Prior to that, you were, with, you were a dean at, at Harvard and... Um, the founding director general of the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico, which I hear is like one of the, the leading institutions in the world in that, in that arena. And then you've written several books, probably too many to count. But uh, I thought it was pretty cool that you've written three books for youngsters on the human body. And you really have a passion just for giving back from what I've been able to tell just in that, in that health and education space, just to help make the world a better place through health and education. So thank you for joining us on the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much for the, for the opportunity. I'm delighted and also to be here at Emerge, which has become such a major convening event uh, in, the, in the innovation space. Well, thank you for being here. This, this is a fun show. Uh, Innovation City is really about people that are breaking the status quo. And I think like when I look back on, on just your history and your life and what you've dedicated to the world, like it's really been breaking through some of those status quo, especially like I, I was uh, listening to an interview you did about some of the health care initiatives that you kind of pushed through uh, dur- I- during your time there in Mexico. So maybe tell us a little bit about, about that. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you innovate in technology, you innovate also in policies and in procedures and in practices. And uh, I did have the opportunity for um, six years to serve as the Secretary of Health of the federal government in Mexico. It was a unique moment. It was the first fully democratic election in 2000. And uh, I guess the, the president-elect, Vicente Fox, was actually the keynote speaker here at Emerge today, just by chance. He, he wanted new faces in, 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 in the political world. Um, uh, so he looked for experts. I was working at the World Health Organization, and, uh, and I had been thinking and studying and writing about how do you best organize and finance a health system. Um, so I was given that incredible opportunity uh, to put into practice a lot of ideas I had both uh, researched about and also written about. Uh, and that, that was an exhilarating experience. And, and it was a very innovative program. It broke the mold of um, uh, tying access to insurance, to health insurance, to employment, which is the same thing that has happened in the United States. Um, and instead, we, we, we decoupled those two things. One thing is to have a job, and another thing is to have health insurance. Access to health care is a right. It's a fundamental right of people. It shouldn't depend on, on the job you have. So we created a very innovative scheme. Uh, at that point, there were 50 million uninsured people in Mexico. Uh, today, that scheme called Seguro Popular, uh, sort of people's insurance, uh, has 58 million affiliates, and it's totally changed the, the character of healthcare in Mexico. And so, obviously, you have a lot of history in healthcare, but I'm also curious about the transition from that to education. So, tell me about that change. Well, you know, health and education are connected because they are the two fundamental investments in people. Um, you know, education defines your future and health defines your present. If you are unhealthy or if you die prematurely, you have no future. So if we really believe that it's the human capital that counts the most, uh, then we have to invest in people. That That's the key for, for development. And the two biggest 
investments are health and education. They create opportunities. They give a sense of fairness in a society. Because if people, if you know, if each new generation doesn't have access to good, high-quality education and to good, high-quality health, nothing else is fair. If a child is born and gets sick with leukemia, which now it can be treated and cured in 90% of cases, at least the most common leukemia, it's not his fault, it's not or her fault, it's not the parent's fault. It's a right of that child because otherwise all of his or her future opportunities will be completely uh, obliterated. Same thing with, with, with education. So health and education are the two uh, engines of opportunity and they make a society fair. Um, so that's, that's why they are my two passions. Education now is probably one of the most vibrant, energetic and exciting areas of innovation. For whatever reason, education was one of the very few uh, areas of human endeavor that did not experience a technological revolution in the 20th century. I mean, compared to healthcare, compared to medicine, I mean, have a totally different health system than what we had in 1900. You know, with more than double life expectancy, it's been an incredible achievement. If you look at the drugs we have, the vaccines, the equipment, the way hospitals look today, uh, it's it's a totally different world if you look at transportation, if you look at communications. And for whatever reason, we came, we arrived at the 21st century with, you know, no major technological breakthrough since the printing press with Gutenberg. I mean, literally. Um, Because, you know, even PowerPoint is just another way of displaying printed words. And now we're we're undergoing that technological revolution. and, and, uh, And that has been coupled with advances in cognitive science. So we know much better than ever how humans learn and that those two factors are driving this education revolution which is one of the most important revolutions of the 21st century wow so in speaking of education um disruption we see that happening you know across across the business many business sectors how do you see education being disrupted and, and how are you preparing to be a part of that change as opposed as opposed to just watching it happen the, the big change is that we need to stop uh, thinking about education as something that happens to young people at defined periods of, of their life and think literally of education as an ongoing process in which you literally never graduate fully. You, you, we, we should have, instead of, I call this a, a tunnel model we have now, you know, in the, in, the, in the highway of your life, you come into this tunnel called university. You come in on one side, that's admissions. Good things happen to you while you're inside the tunnel. And then you emerge at the other side, which is called graduation. That model doesn't work. We need to move into an open architecture where people are coming in and out. uh, Here I'm speaking mostly of higher education. In and out of higher education institutions throughout their entire life. Because the the third uh, uh, force driving the education revolution, in addition to advances in cognitive science and technological innovation, the third big force of the education revolution is the fact that we're going through the most dynamic labor market in human history. Because of advances in automation and artificial intelligence, the nature of jobs is changing completely. You know, there was a study that estimated that a couple of years ago that the kids who were starting school, elementary school that year, 60% of those kids, by the time they finished university, would be working in jobs that didn't exist when they started school. Yeah. And even those jobs that are not brand new or even those jobs that are not fully automated and where humans are replaced by machines, even those jobs will will be transformed radically. So uh, it's not an issue that you graduate and into the real world, as we call it, and then you're out there um, and you're an alum, an alumnus or an alumna. You need to be coming in and out and, uh, of the university as, as your own career progresses and you face new challenges, or as the nature of your job is, is modified radically by, by AI or, or, or automation. I mean, today, for example, if you're a stockbroker, stockbroker firms now are hiring more computer scientists than finance majors. And, <laughs> you know, if, if you're already there, you gotta be able to come and reinvent yourself uh, with those advances. If I look at my own field of medicine, in, in a few years, 
diagnosis, that big part of medical care, which is arriving to a diagnosis, is going to be done much better uh, through artificial intelligence. That means that doctors and nurses are probably going to have to be much better at the interpersonal part of medicine, which I think is a great thing. You know, actually spending time talking to people and trying to understand their circumstances of life. Well, that's a very different way than the way we educate doctors and nurses today. So, so that's, that's, the, that's the big challenge, that the labor market is changing so rapidly that universities need to think of themselves as lifelong providers of educational services, not one shot when you're 18 if you're going to college or when you're 25 if you're going to, uh, to graduate school. We, we got to really uh, have this, this different architecture. And that's where we're moving rather than fixed courses into a little bit of an unbundling. Uh, it's a little bit of what happened with the music industry. Uh, instead of having full courses that are totally integrated into curriculum, we'll still be doing that because you know we're gonna still having young people spend four years of their life in college, in residential college. But on top of that, we need a much more flexible, modular approach that can easily be delivered uh, uh, through highly interactive technologies um, literally, uh, you know, virtual or mixed reality classrooms um, and, and where you will be able to build up those modules according to your own interest and the changing nature of your job requirements. So, uh, obviously, institutions have to prepare for this, this change that's happening, but what can an individual do to prepare for that sort of change as well? Well, that's a great question. I think uh, for for those for everyone who's starting into into school, uh, I think the, the first thing is um, the first thing is to reaffirm the value of going to university, because very often in the innovation space we 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 do hear the you know the legendary stories of uh, you know dropouts, famous yes, dropouts, it's dropout. Bill Gates. Uh, uh, I mean, and all the, fa the the super famous people who have gone on to found Microsoft and Apple and Facebook, etc. But for the vast majority, the 99% of mortals, actually having a, a college degree greatly enhances your opportunities in life. Now, what we need to do on, on our side is to change the curriculum so that, that the college experience is much more relevant. And there's no question that you need to specialize on something because, you know, we live in a society where there's a complex division of labor and people need to be good at something. But in addition to that, more and more, we need to really develop cross-cutting competencies, critical thinking, the ability to identify and correctly uh, uh, diagnose a problem and then develop, devise a strategy to address that problem. Numeracy. It doesn't matter if you're going to go into the humanities. Everyone needs to understand the, 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 the nature of data and how to handle, because we live in, in a big data society. Uh, communication, verbal communication, written communication, and increasingly visual communication. Everyone, doesn't matter how, what you're a specialist in. Ethical reasoning, which is so lacking in, in many areas of public life where everyone has to have the competency to be able to analyze the moral consequences of their choices. The soft skills. The, 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 a lot of soft skills and some, some hard, like critical thinking and, and numeracy. This is why, you know, many have been talking about developing a T-shaped individual through education. There's the vertical piece where you know a lot about something, you are a specialist in something. But then there's a horizontal part of the T, which are this cross-cutting competency that everyone needs to develop because as you go into a changing labor market, this is what's going to give you the edge. That's a, that's a great insight, a T-shape. So great depth, but also breadth of knowledge. Right. So what's, what's the biggest challenge for people trying to become that sort of person as, as they move forward? Is it just kind of our status quo or is it, what is it? Well, for, you know, first of all, you know, we do have a challenge in improving K-12 through 12 as a society. We need to keep investing there. I mean, we've, we, we, the technological disruption is also happening in K-12. Uh, there's, you know, revolutionary innovations like, like um, 
uh, Salman Khan and the Khan Academy that led to this whole concept of, of flipped classrooms, where what used to be called home, homework, which you did at home alone, is what you now do in the classroom. You are working with other students in groups, and the teacher, instead of being the sage on the stage, becomes an advisor who, who guides people in, in, in teamwork around problem solving. And then what you used to do in the classroom, which was to sit passively and listen to someone lecture at you, you can do that and it's much better delivered. Content is much better delivered through online, especially if it's high quality, interactive online material that has embedded simulations, embedded animations, embedded multimedia. So flipping the classroom is something that I think is going to change. Then immersive experiences. At the University of Miami, we just opened an incredible simulation hospital, a whole hospital in our School of Nursing and Health Studies, where you know you simulate situations. Uh, you simulate in an operating room a fire, which rarely but sometimes happens. You don't want to be learning what to do when that happens. You want to have been able to, to, to rehearse that in a simulated environment. Simulation is a way of learning from our mistakes without hurting anyone. That's why pilots, airplane pilots, la- learn how to land a, an airplane in very difficult conditions in a simulator. Because when they face the real thing, they already know how to do it and no one gets hurt. We're doing that increasingly in many other fields, certainly in healthcare. And it's those technologies that are such a, an exciting part of the technological dimension of the educational revolution. So I want to change gears a little bit. You know, when we found out that we we're going to be interviewing you, one of the things that I noticed uh, about your life was just your dedication to gratitude. And I, I just, I was like, wow, that's amazing. So tell me about just in general, like where that came from and then how that leads your, your daily life and, and your mission as, as an individual. Well, as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, my grandparents uh, were forced to leave um, Hamburg where they lived and where my father was born along with his sister, my, my aunt. Um, uh, you know, escaping the, the discrimination, the anti-Semitism, and the horrors of, of, of Nazi Germany. Um, and, you know, they found refuge in a country that was much poorer from an economic point of view, but much richer in what really, really matters, which is tolerance, uh, you know, embracing diversity. So that country was Mexico in the 1930s. Um, they, they were welcome there. Uh, they were strangers. They spoke a different language. They looked differently from a lot of people. Um, and that country served, saved their life and made my own life possible. Uh, and what that has led me is to always reflect on this idea of the generosity uh, uh, towards strangers. You know, it's not very difficult to be generous to your family and friends. You know them, you love them. What's really tough in this world is to be generous to total strangers, people who look different than you, who maybe pray differently than you, speak differently than you, make love differently than you. Being generous to strangers is the biggest test of our humanity. And that's what Mexico gave my parents. So I, uh, along with with my my brother and my sisters and my cousins, my um, we we all have grown with the, up with this big need to give back uh, to the generosity of strangers and that's what driven my entire career I, I, I thought I would channel my, my need to give back through medicine and then I went to public health where society becomes your patient that's, that's what public health is it's a situation where all of society is your patient you try to see how you improve the health of an entire community or an entire country or the entire planet and education those have been my two passions because there's no better way to give back than to invest in, in, in people and, uh, and create opportunity for everyone. So if, if you've listened to episodes of this podcast, you know that it's, it's about people that are, that are making things happen and our audience is people that are probably trying to make things happen in their world as well. So what's, what's your advice that you can give to the people listening that if, if they have a challenge they're trying to push through or they're trying to change something they see as wrong or that... Well, my, my advice, first of all, is to embrace, embrace change. The pace of change is not going to slow down. <laughs> In fact, as the chairman of our board of trustees at UM, Richard Fain, likes to, see, to say, we're living at the, period of, at, at the slowest period of uh, uh, pace of time that we're ever going to have, because it's just going to get faster and faster. So let's embrace change. Change is good. Change is the way the world uh, evolves. 
Now, there is positive and negative change. So we need to make sure that this change is positive. And that's where uh, uh, embracing, along with the idea of change, a, a uh, you know, also a, a, an ethical sense of what is it that we owe the world. And then my, my strong advice is always think about your legacy. Because all of us are here just for a limited period of time. I am much older than you. I'm sure I'm much older than most of, of your uh, viewers and listeners. But, you know, you're all going to get there one day. And we're all going to be gone one day. And the big question we have to ask us is, what do we leave behind? What is it that we want to be remembered for? And if you have that as your guide, then you can embrace change. For younger people, I also tell them part of that change is to be ready for what I call career plasticity. This idea that even in my generation, you would follow one path and you would study one thing, get out of college, get a job in a usually a large employer, and then spend your life is no longer the norm. Today, careers move around. You, you go from one place to another. Um, and and that's, that's an opportunity. Keep an open mind because you never know where an opportunity will, will, um, will, will show up. Have an open mind to taking, take advantage of those. And, and, and do have that sense of what is it that you want to be. Remember, I'm not talking here of picking and, and, and not building anything. But I'm saying within your, your grand vision of what you want your life to be all about, then have that flexibility and embrace the change because most of uh, those who are listening to us will face a very dynamic labor market. And that should not scare us, should actually embolden us, but should commit us to, to try to develop uh, the best of our abilities. Um, analyze what you have as your potential and make sure you take that to, to the utmost limit. Well, Doctor... This has been a pleasure speaking with you and meeting you. How can people, um, you're on Instagram and Twitter, yeah. so how can people find you there? I, well, I, my handle at, um, at Twitter is uh, a, at Julio Frank, with a, separated by a, by a lower uh, dash. And, um, and, you know, you can just uh, search for me. And also, if you go to the webpage of the University of Miami, which is www.miami, Miami, just the word Miami, .edu, for education, edu, you will also find um, uh, all the contact information, including my email. Wonderful. Well, thank you, sir. This has been fun. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, doctor. For more episodes, visit innovationcity.co. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review. And if you're in Miami, visit us on Thursday nights. Details are at VentureCafeMiami.org. And be sure to connect with us on social at We Are Slam and at Venture Cafe MIA. Thanks for listening. This is where it all begins. So say goodbye to all your fears, all your doubts. This is where they die. This is where we come to win. We come to fight. This is what we make our dream